old when I took my last drink. Um, I have a sponsor who has a sponsor and I sponsor women both um, with steps and with service. Um, if you don't know what a service sponsor is, get with me after the meeting. We can talk about that. Um, I, I'm going to tell you some things about myself, some biographical information. None of it means that this is what made me an alcoholic, but I think it's important to share a little bit about where I came from in case, um, there are people who, um, might identify with it. Um, my parents were both profoundly ill people. My mother is a paranoid schizophrenic. My father was uh, addicted to crack cocaine from the time I was four or five years old um, until he committed suicide as, um, at 49. I was um, 11 months sober when that happened. So you can probably imagine that my home life was chaotic. I went to 14 different schools before I dropped out of high school in ninth grade. Um, I had, <clears throat> I had witnessed a lot of domestic violence. I had been, um, sexually abused. There were, um, there were many, many times when I was mortally afraid of my mother. Um, she had delusions about um, the end of the world coming and needing to stock up on food and um, supplies for that. And, um, you know, her brand of religion and her God was about terrifying people into submission. And, uh, and even with that God, I really wanted to, like, connect to something spiritual, even as like a young child. And um, my experience was that um, I was the kind of kid who like wanted attention and wanted to be, um, wanted to be connected to other people because I felt so disconnected from my, my home life. Um, I felt really invisible at home. <clears throat> And um, some people's outside issue is drugs. I mean, I took drugs. I took all of the drugs that were available to me. If the drugs came near me, I took them. Um, but my, my major outside issue was sex and love. And I, I can remember being a five-year-old with a with debilitating crushes on boys. And <clears throat> I filled diaries filled with dramatic <laughs> feelings and, and uh, basically fantasy, a fantasy life that I was having um, from the time I was in kindergarten and until, you know, very recently, really. Um, I... So my like major mode of operation in the world was to like be around people and try to connect with people and try to be really good friends with people and try to get love um, or sex or both. Um, and so when I started drinking when I was 12, um, my idea was that it was going to be party drinking. It was going to be romantic drinking. And then I was going to drink and party and meet people to have sex with. And, um, and I, even though there was alcoholism all over my family, um, I was not really concerned about what was going to happen to me. I mean, I already sort of lived and felt like I like the, the deck was stacked against me. Like there was no way that I was ever going to be able to amount to anything considering my upbringing and my, my family situation and my financial situation. So um, I started drinking when I was 12. I was in seventh grade. I immediately started cutting school. Um, I 
immediately somehow figured out that if you find a homeless guy, that they are often amenable to buying you liquor if you cut them in for a little bit. So I used to buy a bottle of MD-2020 for a guy, and he would buy me whatever I wanted, and we would part ways. And um, sometimes I would ride the bus like 45 minutes to the mall and show up like two hours before it's, it opened because, you know, I should have been in school. <laughs> so I was up at the crack of dawn. Um, but I didn't want to go to school. Um, I wanted to drink. Um, so my drinking progressed very, very quickly. Uh, seventh grade, I was cutting school. Eighth grade, I basically didn't go to school at all, but it still appeared like I was in school. In ninth grade, I, I barely darkened the door for the first two weeks. And, um, I went out on the road. Um, I was done with trying to live under my mother's um, chaotic, terrifying rule. Um, I, you know, I'd had that spiritual bent in my past, but as soon as I started having sex relations, I was pretty sure that, you know, whatever God was around was no longer interested in having a relationship with me. So, um, Hi, baby. I'm, I moved into, um, houses with people's parents and, um, but my drinking would always, um, disrupt family life. Uh, you know, I'd get these girls to go drinking with me instead of doing their homework or doing whatever normal teenagers did. And so their parents would ask me to leave. And so eventually I ended up living in like hippie houses and flop houses and um, um, selling drugs. And, um, you know, I had my 16th birthday in this place and basically the doors were always unlocked. <laughs> Everyone was allowed to be there whenever they wanted to be. It was a party nonstop. And, um, and I thought that that's what I really wanted, but, <clears throat> you know, so many problems come along with the party lifestyle and I was being abused and I was abusing other people and, and eventually I wasn't even able to keep that place to live. <laughs> and then I started trying to nanny for people, but my drinking, um, wasn't appropriate for young children. and um, you know, it was just like the next house on the block, the next house on the block. And, um, you know, I would find ways to, to make money, but I was feeling really ashamed of myself. Not necessarily because I was drinking, but because I thought that I wasn't going to, um, I would be in a better group of people if I was a little more educated. You know, I was feeling kind of superior to the people that I was hanging out with. And I was thinking, okay, you know, it's time for me to go back to school. And like, and I thought, you know, I would just go back to school and that would be fine. But um, what happened to me was I would go to the community college and um, sometimes I would be real gung-ho at the beginning of the semester, get myself all worked up on like a little high and um, and I would get through the semester and I'd have all A's and I'd be like, yes, I did it. Like, like me, I did this. And then, uh, the next semester I would very often find myself unable to walk in the door of the classroom. You know, I was just like paralyzed with anxiety and, you know, I would drink and like sleep the clock around. Um, I was terrible at waking up in the morning. And I was drinking so much that I was throwing up multiple times a day. Um, I'd never really figured out the morning drink, or I used to say that to myself. But um, it was pointed out to me by my sponsor that, um, you know, when you wake up still drunk from the night before at 1130 and you have a beer with lunch, <laughs> 
that's the morning drink. <laughs> You've taken the morning drink. So, so um, you know, I'd always try to make it to some polite hour, but I would get there by sleeping until that time. Um, and so I would drink and I would throw up and I was the worst puker ever. If I was puking, everybody in the house knew about it. <laughs> and like, I was drinking to like make friends and the only friend that I ever really made was the toilet bowl. Like me and porcelain super close hung out all the time, every single day. And instead of like hanging out with people and doing the thing that I thought I wanted to be doing, I was passed out at eight o'clock because I'd overshot the mark or I would get super, super drunk and I would try to fuck your boyfriend. And like, that's not a recipe for like long lasting, um, friendship, you know? So my reputation around town was not one that people wanted to hang out with. And, um, I left a, a trail of broken hearts behind me and, um, it was time for me to get out of town. So... <laughs> So every couple of months, I would just move one zip code over and try to set up a new life in a new place that was seven minutes from the last place I lived. And then I would go to the next town and I, I would try my fresh start. And um, my fresh starts lasted like two days. Um, and then... At some point, I figured out, you know, that, like, life wasn't working for me. Uh, I wasn't getting anywhere. I wasn't feeling good. I wasn't feeling good about myself. My body was breaking down. I was sick all the time. And, um, and I was hurting people. And I didn't understand why I couldn't have relationships. Like, every, every effort that I made failed. Um, so I thought maybe I needed to sober up and, um, there was this older guy who used to come into the record shop that I worked in at the time and he always stunk a liquor and I always felt, um, superior to him. Like, oh, you know, he comes in here smelling like a brewery where, <laughs> you know, I used to roll in still drunk from the night before. There was no way I was smelling like a rose in that store. It was a small store. I'm sure everybody could smell me too. But like, I'm to totally in denial. But uh, one day he came in and he didn't smell a liquor. And um, like any good alcoholic, as soon as somebody around me changes their drinking behavior, I'm like, tell me all about this you're drinking, you're drinking less, you're drinking more. Tell me what's going on. So I, I was like, dude, you, you're not drinking. He said, no. And I said, what, why? And he said, well, I, um, I was drinking and I got into an accident with my car. So they, they took my license and then, um, I was drinking and I got into an accident with my bike. <laughs> and they took my bike. So so now um you know I'm going to AA. And uh I'm like AA. All right. My grandfather had been in AA for like 100 years. All my uncles were in AA or dad. So like a new AA was a thing, but it hadn't really occurred to me that it was available to me in some way. So um, he offered to take me to the meeting. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm out of here at 7. He's like, great, meeting's at 7.30. It's right down the street, big white church. You know it. I'm like, yeah, I know it. I think I'll see you there. So it's probably like noon at this point. And um, at first it seems like a really good idea, and I'm kind of excited to go. And as the hours ticked by, um, you know, that morning drink hadn't gone in me yet, you know, my noontime drink, I started to feel a little ill and, um, going to the meeting seemed like less and less a good idea by the time I was about to leave work. 
And I thought to myself, I, oh, you know, I'm not really feeling so hot. I don't think I should go to the AA meeting. I'm just going to go to the bar for one. And then I'm going to go home and sleep. And the bar for one has never, never, ever happened. Maybe the bar for three, and then I would go home. But, like, there was no way ever of knowing whether or not it was going to be three or it was going to be as many as I could put in my body physically. So, but, <clears throat> so that guy got stood up that night, but a seed was definitely planted. And over the next couple of years, um, I tried to go to AA. You know, I went to my first meeting when I was 19. And um, I didn't take my last drink until I was 23. And um, my description of that time in my life is that I would go to AA, I would sit down, I would feel the oceanic feeling of being connected to a group of people like I'd never felt before in my life. And I would cry and I would want it and I would feel at home and I would feel like you guys were going to accept me. And then I would walk out of the door and the feeling would slowly dissipate. And the next time a person asked me if I wanted to go and have a drink, I would go and have a drink. And like no thought of that, you know, wonderful feeling came back to me until I was in despair again. And I was drinking and I was drinking and driving every day. I was driving with bottles of beer in my hand. I didn't care about anybody or anything. I kept hitting parked cars. I was driving a white car. It wasn't mine. My friend got a DWI and she couldn't drive it anymore. So I was driving this car and it was white. And every morning I would check the side of the car to see what color paint was um, scraped on the side. And um, the cops would pull me over, but I, I lived in a small town and my boss was real well known. So they would tell me that they would um, follow me home. And so they'd follow me home and I'd wait for them to leave and I would go back out. And <clears throat> so my boss, I'd been working at the shop for like five years. My boss was like, you know, you're 21 years old. You've been working here for five years. You're not in college. What are you doing? Are you going to do something? He's like, why don't you apply to school again? He's like, I'll keep all your money, and I'll give it to you at the end of the summer, and you can go away to school. So here's somebody, like, give, putting something on a silver platter for me. and be like, okay. So at the end of that summer, I drove up to Albany, New York. I started going to school and I had sobered up over the summer. I had like 90 days. And, um, as soon as I got to my new town, many more, um, zip codes away than I had ever been before. Um, I got into town. I went to maybe one meeting and, um, and I got lonely. I didn't know anybody. And, um, it was September 11, 2001. Um, they had rolled TVs out onto the campus, um, the outside of the campus to watch the towers go down and people were having all of these conversations with each other and everybody felt really close to each other, almost like it felt when I was in an AA meeting. And, um, but that didn't make me go to an AA meeting. I asked people, um, Asked people like where the weirdos hung out, and uh, they told me a place called Lark Street. And I'm sure every town that you guys have or live close to has the street where all the weirdos hang out. And so I went down there, and um, I was looking for company, and um, I got a drink instead. I mean, I got company, but so this guy is sitting outside of a bar. And we get to talking. He asked me if I want a beer. And I say, no, I'm in AA. He said, oh, my mom's in AA. Do you want to go smoke some weed? 
And I said, yeah, yeah. So um, six months later, all that money that my boss had saved for me, gone. Landlord's looking for me. And uh, my boyfriend had been stealing all of the drugs from a cancer patient that was living with his mother. And whatever ones he'd like picked out and decided weren't the weren't the ones that he liked, I amassed all of those and I took them all at one time. I was like, "Fuck this, I'm done." So, um, I was, um, I was passed out for like 36 to 48 hours. I'm not even exactly sure. Uh, I didn't die. And in the morning, I called the doctor and um, and I said, "I'm alive." And he said. Why don't you go back to AA? So I called that guy's mother and I said, I hear you're in AA. <laughs> and she said, Yeah, I'll help you. So I started going to AA. Um, I went to AA every day. I went to AA multiple times a day. On Friday in my town, you could go to five meetings in a day. And I was in college um, and uh, I didn't have much to do other than homework. And there was an AA clubhouse right across the street from uh, a computer lab on campus. Um, so I went and I did service. Uh, I took up a coffee pot. I got a sponsor right away. And um, just an incredible amount of willingness was, was in me um, in that short period of time. And I took advantage of it as much as I could. Um, the woman who I asked to sponsor me, uh, it turns out many years later was only six months more sober than I was, <coughs> but she read me the big book and where it said to pray, we prayed. And when it said to write, I wrote and, um, she, I told her about my mother's God and she said, uh, that I didn't have to believe in anybody else's God. I just had to not argue with anybody about anybody else's God. You know, everybody gets to have their own and, um, there's no reason to have a conversation about it with anybody. Um, and so like, sometimes I would try to connect with people by arguing with them. So that avenue was off the table. And, <clears throat> you know, it was really rebellious about it. But um, I was about three weeks sober, and I was living in this downtown area with where all the college kids lived all together. They called it the student ghetto. And there was a bar that I liked that was right up the street. And um, I had been sober, and I had, like, been reading this book with this lady. And she had talked to me about prayer. And um, I just got a wild hair up my ass, and I decided that I was going to put on my makeup, and I was going to go to the bar. And so I'm all ready, I'm dressed, I'm going out, I'm walking up the street, and then and an idea comes to me. Maybe you should pray. And I was like, fuck. Really? Ugh. But some kind of willingness was in me, and I was like, okay. And I closed my eyes, and there was probably nothing to the prayer. I may have said the word God in my head for a second but I'll tell you I had this like warm rush of feeling and suddenly I was willing to turn around take my makeup off and go to bed and I did not have an urge to drink again for over a year um, I did I did my work I wrote my resentments I found out that I was a really resentful first grader my father once uh, told me that he had told a boy that I liked, that I liked him when I was in like kindergarten. And um, I didn't talk to him again for like nine months. Yeah, that's a six-year-old was so mad. She wouldn't speak to her father whom she loved dearly for nine months. So <clears throat> I was a grudge holder. So I found out all about myself and, um, and I became real willing to like become a new kind of person and to try things 
and to um, let go of my old beliefs about how the world worked, my old beliefs about myself and what I was worth. And I, I finished college and um, I went to graduate school and I got married and I bought a house and I had a ton of sponsees and some cats and I was doing what I thought sober people did. And really I just wanted to be normal. Now I had like this taste of what it was like to be normal and have like relationships with people that lasted more than a few nights. And, um, but it turns out that my motives were not in the right spot and that marriage ended after seven years. And I was in a, in a kind of a low spot and uh, I was turned on to young people's service. I was like 30, but they let me come and um, stand for a position. And uh, I did a host year for ECPOB, the Eastern Area Conference of Young People in Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, it revolutionized my sobriety. Uh, I left my husband. Um, I did the steps again. Um, and I made, I made the relationships that I had always desperately wanted in my life. And those women are still my best friends today. And so I know today what it is like to be truly connected to another human being. And that's all I really, really ever wanted. And Alcoholics Anonymous, and here we trust each other, like we're in the trust business. It says in the big book that an alcoholic can win the confidence of another alcoholic in a couple of hours. And that's a wonderful feeling to have. Um, it also can be really dangerous. Um, I know in my experience, I have not always been the safest person to be around. And um, I've seen a lot of things where people do not act in a safe manner toward people, especially newcomers. So I just want to invite everybody tonight to think about how um, they can be safer people to be around in AA because um, we need to connect with each other in order to survive. But we also need to make sure, I need to make sure that in my instinct to connect that I, I'm not damaging anyone. And um, that's all I wanted to share. Thanks for letting me share. <laughs>